study of God's Word and turn with me to Titus chapter 3 this morning. Titus chapter 3. It is fitting in expositional preaching that God in His providence times certain texts for the appropriate timing and the appropriate season to which we find ourselves in. Titus chapter 3 is where we have come to in our study through this book, this epistle. Remind yourself that it is Titus who would be ordered or appointed by Paul to go to Crete, to go to this island in the Mediterranean Sea where the culture is quite ungodly, where the culture is described as being brutes, liars, gluttons, beasts. The description is pretty rough. It's a pretty rough situation. But there are no doubt sheep of God's fold that have responded in faith to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they are gathered together as an assembly of believers. And when Paul went there, he admitted that there were some things that still needed to be taken care of. First on the list was to appoint elders to those flocks. And he gave the qualifications for those elders. He made sure that they were men of integrity, men spirit-led, men called. You know those qualifications. They had to meet those criteria. But he also said that there is a behavior pattern that should be reflected in those who call themselves Christians on this island of Crete, regardless of what the situation is with the culture. Now, I also need to set up the situation by reminding you that in this particular setting, you have um, Roman government flooding everywhere, and so you don't have Christians at the helm of government. You have a very anti-God type government. As a matter of fact, you have a government that says they themselves are, in fact, God, deity. And so you have some really difficult issues to work through. So this is not an easy place for, for Paul to send Titus to direct uh, the church to establish a more healthy pattern of living. All of that being said, look with me at chapter 3 now. We're going to begin reading in verse number 1, and then we're going to go all the way through to verse number 5 in our reading. However, we are not going to try to tackle um, um, everything there. Actually, we're reading through verse 7. We're just going to study verses 1 and 2 today and hopefully shed some light on uh, what this text means and how we live it out in our day today. So let's begin reading in Titus chapter 3, verse number 1. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to, be, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And we'll stop there, but I want to repeat verses 1 and 2. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Let's pray together. Father, we call upon you, the author and finisher of our faith, the sovereign Holy One, the only true God. We call upon you 
not only to worship and adore you, but to ask of you that you would do in our hearts what we are incapable of doing ourselves. That you would take this true, objective word, inerrant, inspired, God-breathed word, and would you take it into the ears and to the minds of the listener, and would you do that supernatural work of pressing it into our hearts in such a way that you change us forever? Would you do that not so that David Freilich would be known or that New Hope Baptist would be known, but would you do that so that Jesus would be known? In Christ we pray. Amen. This word that starts off this chapter, remind them, an interesting word. It's just to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of grammar, just so you know. It's in the present imperative tense, which means it's an ongoing command. We could say it like this, keep on reminding them. Now, who is the them? The them is obviously the believers who are gathered in Crete. When I made the emphatic references in chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, that he redeemed us, us was used a lot, that same pronoun is referring back to the same pronoun them is referring back to. It's the believers that are in Crete who are under the direction of Titus. Remind them. This word remind in the Greek means to put another thing in the mind of something. It almost leads us to think about the way we say when we say jogging one's memory. We would say it like that. By some kind of association or similarity, we will remind someone or we will jog their memory about it. The older that Margaret and I get, the more we forget things, and so we eventually we will, if we forget something, we will recall the location where we said it, or, or the situation we were in when we said it, and then we will inevitably look at each other and go, oh yes, yes, I, I get it, I understand now, yes. You did tell me that, I don't hate you anymore. Um, you know, we, we keep reminding each other, and, and what, is, what is it, that, needs, uh, that, that is needful to be reminded. Well, honestly, the reason that remind comes up so much in Scripture or remember comes up so much in Scripture is because in our flesh we are so prone to forget, either by the inability to remember or just simply because of our waywardness and our sinfulness, we don't even want to remember. And so uh, Kent Hughes, one of the commentators that I love, who's a pastor, he said, a large part of any pastor's public ministry is reminding people of what they already know. And that's so true. Because oftentimes, as saints of God, you're coming into this room and hearing from the Word of God not really a ton of things that are brand new to you. They're reminders to you. They're things that help you remember and recall and reflect and and rejoice in. And so that's often what the public proclamation ministry is, is reminders to the saints of God of different things that uh, you already know. And this uh, verb reminds us, or at least implies, that these Cretan saints, these saints at Crete, already knew these things, but they are, like us, they are non-glorified saints. In other words, they're not in heaven yet, so they don't remember everything. And so they were in continual need of a fresh reminder Today, we sang a song that helps us think about that. It's a good song. Let me give you some background for it, though, but it's very interesting. And as I said a few weeks ago, I'm just I'm loving the stories behind the, the hymns that we sing. But Robert Robinson is the one who wrote the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, in 1758. That's an old song. So if you're wondering, man, are we... I wish we'd sing some of the old songs. That's pretty old. That's prior to the Declaration of Independence, you know? Did anybody know that? This song was written prior to America becoming a nation. Pretty old song. Robert Robinson, interesting enough, had a pretty rough childhood. His parents were um, very frustrated with him, so they sent him to barber school. He was going to learn to be a person who 
cut men's hair. And he liked to drink. And by the way, always bad to go to a drunk barber. That's a good lesson there. But anyway, his friends and Robert loved getting drunk. And one night when they got drunk, they decided to go to a fortune teller. And they go to this fortune teller. Interesting how God uses even pagan witchcraft stuff to, um, to frighten people about what's coming. And while drunk, Robert Robinson and his friends go to this fortune teller, and she starts telling things about the future. And he gets spooked and says, Hey, guys, while uh, recovering from his drunkenness, Hey, guys, we need to go to an evangelistic meeting, and I've heard about this guy named George Whitfield. <clears throat> George Whitfield, who had a booming voice. Without the use of megaphone, was speaking to thousands of people. And they went to this evangelistic meeting. Robert, and it, it, as the account goes, not all of his drunk buddies went to this particular meeting. They, they couldn't all make it for some, some strange reason. Let me fix this here, piece. So for some strange reason, they couldn't all make it to the evangelistic meeting. But he goes, and George Whitfield is preaching from Matthew 7, and he gets to uh, talking about the wrath to come. And Robert Robinson remembers George Whitfield saying in this booming voice, Oh, the wrath to come. Oh, the wrath to come. It was three years later, Robert Robinson had tried to put to rest this wrath to come. And he couldn't shake it. And so, in the framework of time, after hearing the gospel, he said, the Lord caught me and opened his eyes, regenerated him. He became a converted person and uh, became a committed Christian to the faith. And uh, by the way, George Whitfield, this Calvinistic Methodist, by the way, um, was a faithful brother, and Robert Robinson knew of only to follow him in that. Gary, could you uh, stop the twinkling over there just by taking that one out? Um, there's like lightning bolts flashing over here in the corner, and all I can see is the twinkle of Ryan's head <laughs> blinking. So... Uh, I don't know which one it is, but uh, whoever knows how to work those lights, go over there and, ooh, that's a drastic effect. You'll have to manipulate. Can somebody go over and manipulate? Can you go manipulate them, James, so that that particular section is out? Um, but anyway, um, it's funny because at New Hope, we never have claimed that we're great at technology. Um, we just know that the Word of God must be preached. That's all we're going to claim to know. But anyway, so Robert Robinson became a songwriter. And just so that you won't drift so far from the Robert Robinson account, I was telling you that reminding them is important because we are prone to forget. We are prone to forget things, okay? And when we're prone to forget things, we need to be reminded. And Robert Robinson, even after salvation, acknowledged how Christians are prone to forget. And we sang it this morning. We sang it this morning. Let me give you the verse from Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Here it comes. He said this as a Christian. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Can, can you identify with that as a Christian? Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Now, we may not ever say that, but we sung it today. Prone to leave the God I love. And then he says this as a prayer. Here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And you know, in fact, Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 4 says he indeed did that. Sealed to the day of redemption. Prone to leave the God I love. Lord, how often you know that I need to be reminded of these truths that I say I believe. I need to be reminded over and over and over. Remind them, verse number 1 in chapter 3, 
remind them. But what do we need to remind them of? Titus, what do you need to remind those Cretans of? We need to remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. To be obedient, to be ready for every good work. Remind them to be submissive. Submissive. This word submissive, hupotazo, is used oftentimes in the marriage relationship concerning wives submit to your husbands. There's, there's a leader in the, in the house. But it means simply to place under in an orderly fashion. The goal is orderliness. And so submission means you're placing yourself under. But notice who he says to place yourself under. Submissive to rulers and authorities. Rulers first, the word rulers, arche in the Greek, it simply means those who are first in the order of the community. Those who are the first ones in the town. We actually still use this kind of language when we speak of um, the president and the first lady. It's the, the first, that, that, that rank is what we're talking about. Now, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. This word authorities, exousia. This is an interesting word to be used in this particular situation. This word means delegated authority. It combines the idea of the right to exercise this authority and the might to exercise this authority. In other words, the right and the power to do it. Okay? Now keep following with me because this is going to get very, very interesting. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities. Now can you hear the Cretans who are Christians in this church, in this gathering? Can you hear them? Can you hear their, their 21st century anxiousness just fueling up as they know that from 54 AD to 68 AD, the emperor in charge is a Roman emperor by the name of Nero? And you can hear the Christians in Crete going, well, when there's a conservative leading the Roman Empire... That's what we'll do. And that's what the Christian community thinks. Oftentimes. Especially in America. Now by the way, I'm baiting the hook. And getting ready to reel it in. I feel it. That's our, that's our impulse is to say, I'll follow, I'll submit to a leader that lines up with my thinking, that lines up with Christian thinking. Well, first of all, you've got to understand, in Crete, that was not the case. You remember what is said about the Cretans, right? They're not all born again. They're evil brutes, lazy gluttons, liars. Wow. That's what they are. But you submit to them. You submit to the rulers and the authorities. It's interesting this word authority, by the way, and this will probably bait the hook even more. It's interesting this word authority is used most often and most importantly as a term in the Gospels for the conflict that would often arise between Jesus and his ministry, and his life, and this issue of exousia would get debated a lot between Jesus teaching with unparalleled exousia and the Pharisees saying, where do you get your authority from? So you had this conflict going on in the Gospels between Jesus having exousia and the earthly rulers, the Pharisees, saying, no, 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 we have exousia. Where did your exousia come from? Where's this authority coming from? Who are we supposed to obey? Jesus or the earthly authorities? Jesus, where did you get your authority? Verse number one continues. To be obedient. Remind them to be submissive. Remind them to be obedient. This simply means don't be known, Christian Cretans, for disobeying 
clear laws given. Don't be known for being belligerent. Don't be known for being insubordinate. Be obedient. Do what's right. When you're riding in your chariot in Crete, and you're supposed to use the right-hand side of the Roman roads, built all roads leading to Rome, do it. Be obedient. But notice also in verse number 1, be ready for every good work. Be ready for every good work. Now look back with me, if you will, at Titus chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, and you'll see that the reason God saved us was first of all for His own glory, but not only for His own glory, but, but to save a people who were zealous for good works. Listen to verse 13. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, here it is, who are zealous for good works. And Paul is telling Titus, remind them to be ready for every good work. To be ready for every good work. And what sets the stage for that being ready for every good work is the fact that you've been born again. You've been redeemed. Uh, flip over with me for just a moment to, ty- to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, probably a familiar passage to you. And once again, I'm reminding you of something that you probably already know. But listen to Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now listen to verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So the point is, Titus. Back in chapter 3 now, verse 1, tell them to be ready for every good work, which, by the way, is what you've been saved to do. It's what you've been redeemed to do, is to fulfill every good work, to be ready for every good work. Verse number 2 now of Titus chapter 3 as we walk through this. Verse number 2, remind them to speak evil of no one. To speak evil of no one. Man, is this convicting. To speak evil of no one. The Greek word here is blasphemeo. Our English word, blaspheme. To blaspheme no one. Well, you might be thinking blaspheme in the spiritual sense is to blaspheme the Holy Ghost or to, to talk maliciously about the Son of God. Well, blaspheme also can mean how you're speaking about someone else, not even referring to anything as far as deity is concerned. You can blaspheme another person in this text. Listen, this word means simply to hurt, to injure, to harm. Literally, to speak in order to harm someone. To bring into ill repute or to defame or to harm the reputation. It means to rail at, we are familiar with that term, to revile, scold, to be abusive in our language, to speak calumny, basically. It means to utter false charges or maliciously calculate or to speak against someone. It's interesting that this word, speak evil of no one, blasphemeo, used 34 times in the New Testament. Most of the time it's used as maligned or hurling insult, reviling, or speaking against. Now I want to tell you that there is a time, when we look at John the Baptist, there is a time to speak truth to power. John the Baptist did it a lot. There is a time to speak truth to power. But folks, remember that it is truth that you speak to power. Not preference, not opinion, not slander. It is truth that you speak to power. But if you're like me, you have to be reminded of what the psalmist said, what David said 
as a prayer so that you can actually fulfill this, remind them to speak evil of no one, you have to do what Psalm 141.3 says, is ask God to do this. Listen to what David said. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. That's Psalm 141.3. Set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. What David is saying is, God, I have a case of the can't help it when it comes to my mouth. God, I need your help. And I don't know if you live in the same world as I, but I think even introverts are dying to open the door of their lips to say some things. But I want you to notice also that this word is used somewhere else. Paul uses this word blasphemeo in 1 Timothy 1.20. Hamanius and Alexander are two people inside the assembly who the Bible says were delivered over to Satan so that they may be taught not to do what? Not to blaspheme. Now listen, the context does not force us to believe that they were talking heretically, even though they might have been. What could have been happening is that they were talking maliciously, out of turn, and could not keep their mouths shut. So it's not that Hermanius and Alexander necessarily were kicked out of the church, handed over to Satan because they didn't get the deity of Christ right. It could very well have been that they were handed over to Satan because they couldn't keep their mouth shut. And I would say to you that many churches have been systematically dismantled, not because of a rejection of the deity of Christ, but because some people couldn't keep their mouth shut. But I'm going to focus. Yes, thank you for your prayers. So, be ready for every good work. Speak evil of no one. Avoid quarreling. Another command. Remind them to avoid quarreling. This word is a compound word. Ah and makos. Ah is a, a, a negating term, a negating prefix. So it means not or without. And the word Makos is the word battle. So it's a word meaning without battle, without a fight, without a conflict. So this word is actually, in some translations, rendered not quarrelsome, which certainly is understandable. It stresses that the person is not contentious. And so Wiest says it like this. Kenneth Wiest in his word study says, a makos describes a person who does not go about with a chip on his shoulder. This is um, someone who is probably more apt or disposed to quarrel in a petty manner. They have this ill-natured readiness to fight without a good cause. They're always uh, loving um, to stir up an argument. To avoid quarreling. And by the way, you might say this was a little bit easier in that day. Um, and I would say to you it probably was a little bit easier to avoid quarreling even though the Genesis 3 was still intact and still being sanctified by the grace of God. There was not so many outlets for communication in Titus chapter 3. In Crete, you don't have all these avenues of communication. It's word of mouth or it's public forum or a public herald who's saying certain things to the community at large. These days we have so many streamlined ways of communication. It's, it's a very interesting one to apply. But to avoid quarreling meant that you're not looking contentiously with a chip on your shoulder ready for anything to happen. And by the way, the only other New Testament use of this word is in the description of elders. Not be contentious. Not be ready to pick fights. So not only does an elder have to meet that qualification, Titus is telling the Cretan Christians, look, you too need to be not hunting for a fight. 
You don't need to do that. So avoid quarreling. And then, even in verse number two, to be gentle. To be gentle. Uh, Kenneth Weiss, in his word study, said this is probably one of the most difficult words to translate, even though it sounds very simple. It's a word, another compound word, epiikis. Epi is that prefix on the front of it that just intensifies the meaning, if you want to look at it that way. Sometimes it means upon, or, but mainly it means to intensify whatever the root word's going to be. So whatever the root word is, it's going to intensify it. And eikos is the root word, meaning fair or equitable. So a really intense fair, a really intensified equity. One commentator rendered it a sweet favorableness. That's an interesting way to say it. Uh, this word includes the idea of gentle, forbearing, equitable, lenient, all of these different ways of saying it. We understand what it means to be gentle. We understand what it means to be uh, not just kind, but an intensified type of fairness intensified type of fairness okay that means to be gentle but then this last command in verse number two to show perfect courtesy toward all people now before we move on to that let me just say a few more words about being gentle i uh, lost sight of this christians who are gentle are not insistent on the letter of the law. They're willing to compromise where no moral issue is at stake. If there's a moral issue at stake, it's different. But if there's no moral issue at stake, they're, they're going to exercise what is called that sweet reasonableness that is helpful in the situation. Matthew Henry said it like this. He said, gentleness means not taking words or actions in the worst sense. And for peace, sometimes yielding somewhat of a strict right. So, in other words, not taking words or actions in the worst sense. You know, this is what happens maybe five years into marriage instead of the first four of marriage. Uh, get ready, newlyweds. By the way, have a new son-in-law, be coaching them as well. Um, how many of you have heard this word? Have, have, how many of you have heard this phrase? Honey, it's not what you said. It's what? It's the way you said it. And there, there is this incredible ability for us to take words in their worst sense. We do it to politicians all the time, especially if they are on opposite ends of where we view. When we hear someone say something, what do we do with it? You know what he meant? He meant he wants to kill Christians. No, uh, no, no. Let's be a little bit more gentle than that. Let's be a little bit more gentle. We take it in the worst sense, and when we do that, we're not fulfilling this particular command to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy towards all people, which is the next reference. And by the way, don't ever forget this. He's asking us to show sweet reasonableness. Who's in charge? Well, the Republicans, of course. The conservatives. They're the ones in charge incorrect they didn't have stupid crap like that back then it was just one group one family led the whole thing Nero and his family and particularly Nero okay he's a dictator okay he's in charge and we're supposed to exercise a sweet reasonableness hmm we're supposed to exercise a sweet reasonableness to what you have described in Holy Scripture as liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons? Well, if that's what we're commanded to do, I don't know that I can do that. Can I say you're right? You can't do it. 
you will never do it. I, w- I, I won't ever do it. It will only be the supernatural work of the Spirit of God to exercise a sweet reasonableness to evil beasts, lazy, glutton liars in that context. Show perfect courtesy toward all people. Perfect courtesy. Wow, what a word in the Greek that comes to life. You, you, you see where we, we show perfect courtesy toward all people. Show perfect courtesy, three words, and the Greek says it in one. I don't know the particular pronunciation of this word. It's P-R-A-U-T-E-S in the Greek original New Testament. But it was used a lot in secular Greek writings. A lot. The main way that the word was used was in the writings describing a soothing wind. Sometimes it was used to describe a healing medicine. And sometimes it was used to describe a cult that had been broken. Interesting. With all of those descriptions in secular Greek writing and in biblical Greek writing, but particularly secular Greek writing, you can tell that in every one of those there's power within those things. For example, a soothing wind can become a storm, too much medicine can kill, a horse can break loose. What this is getting to is very close to the word meek, where it is power under control. Power under control. Show courtesy to all people. Perfect courtesy towards all people. You have the power to do all kinds of stuff to them, but your power is under control. You are submitted, first of all, to God and then to them so that you can show courtesy. At any moment, you could, yes, pull a third-degree redneck, go off, and shoot people. Yes, you could do that. But there's power under control. And by the way, that power is not under control if you have to announce what I just said before you go up and talk to them. You know, if Jesus wasn't in me, I'd cut your throat. No. That's really not showing perfect courtesy to everyone. Okay? So let me read this text again. We've walked through, hopefully, and by the way, when he says toward all people, he's referring to the people that are not them. The people that are not the us. He's saying those on the outside of faith, treat them this way. Now, let me read the text one more time. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. Now the fuel for this which we will not get to today, the fuel for this is in verses 3 and following. At one time we too were foolish. At one time we too were enslaved by all kinds of passions and earthly pleasures. But the kindness and mercy of God appeared to us, changed us. By the grace of God, we are what we are. And we praise God for that. But this text tells us to do things, tells that group of Cretans to do things under leadership, under governing officials that do not speak their language, that do not line up with them, that do not represent Christian principles. And this is what they're called to do. Well, I am thankful that expository preaching addresses issues providentially So the question becomes, how do I live out this text? David, if what you're saying is true, and this is what this is telling us in this text, then how do I live this out? How do I do this? And I want to tell you, you better hang on for the ride on this one. Hang on for the ride. Because it is not always simple to determine whether the laws of a state actually forbid what God commands 
or command what God forbids. But nevertheless, the principle of obeying the Creator before the state always remains. Always. You know why? Because Christ is Lord even over the state. And when the state rejects His Lordship, Christians are called to submit to the laws as long as it is not commanding that which God forbids. So here's the question of the day. The question of the day is, as you look at this text, the question of the day is, when as Christians should we disobey? When as Christians should we go against what is commanded of us from the government? When do we go against it? Can we go against it? Titus 3 says, you know, regardless of them being godless, is there a time when we go against it? Well, there's been many references cited on this issue. And by the way, you have to remember where Titus is at. Crete, Nero's the Roman emperor, he's godless, he sets Christians on fire to escape the blame that he started the fire in Rome, and so he, he makes the Christians literally candles for the night, human torches, and Paul's still saying this, okay? So the question becomes, when do Christians... I think this is cutting in and out on me, buddy. When do Christians... You just go here if you want. Because it's annoying me. Dang devil, flipping the lights and working on this microphone. That dang devil. I'm going to turn into George Whitfield. Turn off all the power. Let the booming voice go. Anyway, so I digress. So here's the deal. How do we, as Christians, process through all of this stuff? Man, I'm telling you, it's the flavor of the day, and, and we're, we're doing things that other churches are not doing, and that doesn't make us more spiritual. It might reveal to us our convictions about things. I think it does. But let me tell you that in fairness, there are tons of scriptures that I want us to go to for a few moments to look at, take some time to do that. So journey with me through the scriptures because I think that you're going to be, um, at this point you're thinking, David's going a different direction. He's personally having a different viewpoint. I baited the hook if that's what you're thinking. Romans 13, let's go there for a moment. This was the verse that came to our attention when all this COVID stuff and restrictions came into play, well, if churches were doing the right thing, they ought to be doing this. Romans 13, 1 through 7, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. Those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. To which I say amen to that entire text. The governing authorities are there to, uh, for our good. They are not there for our harm. They are there for our good. And we should submit to them. Don't do evil. Do what is right. 
That's absolutely true. Now look at another st- text that sets the stage, 1 Peter 2. Go there with me for a moment. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, 13. First Peter 2, 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. You see there? You see the motive? Don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. But living as servants of God, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. So those are two texts in the New Testament that kind of set the stage for um, the Christian's perspective from the New Testament on how to view those who God has placed in authority. Okay? But you can't just stop there. You can't just stop with those texts and then say, well, whatever the government calls us to do, that's just what we, that's just what we do. Well, there's three different views on this. And by the way, Michael Haldman, who put together gotquestions.org, is a, is a great resource that I found for this, um, along with some other thoughts that I had in my own heart and mind about what the Scripture teaches. But he gave this account. He said, when it comes to this issue of what's under the umbrella of civil disobedience. In other words, when a civil magistrate or a civil official gives you a directive, when are you called to disobey that directive? When are you called to not follow it? So civil disobedience is not rioting. We're not talking about that. That's never a permission slip for a Christian. Uh, He's always called to be uh, kind and gentle while he refuses particular orders. But one one view that um, Michael Haldeman brought to the attention was the anarchist view that says that a person can choose to disobey the government whenever he likes and whenever he feels he's personally justified in doing so. Well, according to Romans 13, there is no biblical precedence for that. The anarchist is, is not able to act within the bounds of Christian ethics. He, he's, he's not going to get a pass on that. Then you have the extremist patriot, according to Michael Haldeman, who says that a person should always follow and obey his country no matter what the command. Now that's also wrong because during the Nuremberg trials, the attorneys for the Nazi war criminals, you know, those who were captured and tried in the court of law as Nazis who killed many people, they attempted to use the defense that their clients were only following the direct orders of the government and therefore could not be held responsible for their actions. But one of the judges, this is a great quote. I don't know who said it, which one of the judges said it in that trial. One of the judges dismissed their argument with the simple question. But gentlemen, is there not a law above our laws? Hey, I believe that guy, while not maybe even knowing it, just verified for us what the Scripture says, that the righteous requirements of the law is written on their hearts. Is there not a law that's above even ours that are written down? Then you have what we would say is the position of Scriptures, where it's one of biblical submission, with the Christian being allowed to act in civil disobedience to the government if... That government commands evil. But even then, it requires that a Christian act in a manner that is consistent with clear teachings. It it does not allow us to, to act ungodly when we're in disagreement. Now, take your Bibles, and I want to walk through and show you some places in the Scriptures in the scriptures where there is examples of civil disobedience in the scriptures let's go to exodus 1 that's the first place exodus 1 and i'm going to conclude today 
with a place where the elders are crystal clear on us being prepared for civil disobedience. Exodus chapter 1. You know what's happening in Exodus chapter 1, right? Let me just recap it for you. The Egyptian Pharaoh gives the clear command to Hebrew midwives, two of them. They were to kill all the male Jewish babies. That was their command. Where's that coming from? Where's that command coming from? Governing official, Pharaoh. You who are helping those Hebrew women have babies. If that's a male, kill him. That was the order. The extreme patriot who I was mentioning earlier would say, that's, that's the order, therefore, that's the order. You've got to do it. Now look at chapter 1 of Exodus, verse 17. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. Interesting. An order is given from governing official, and these people disobey that order. Verse number 20 now. So God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, He gave them families. What was the motive of the midwives? Scared of the governor? Scared of the Pharaoh? Scared of the official? No, no. They feared God. That's what the text says. They feared God and they violated the governing official's command. That's one example. Go over to Joshua chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2. Are you familiar with a lady named Rahab? A lady named Rahab, chapter 2, verse 1. And Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shipham as spies, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, Behold, men of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. Then the king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. That is an order directly from the top governing official. Verse number four. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for, they, for you will overtake them. But she brought them up to the roof and hid them with the stalks of flax that she had laid in order of, on the roof. So the men pursued after them on the way to the Jordan as far as the fords, and the gate was shut as soon as the pursuers had gone out. Now, I'm not here to tell you that Joshua 2 advocates lying. I am here to tell you that there was a direct order given by the king of Jericho, and Rahab went against it. And the Lord honored Rahab, and she's even included in the book of Hebrews. She's even talked about in the New Testament. She is one of those elect Gentiles, without a doubt. Keep going with me. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 14. 1 Samuel chapter 14. 1 Samuel chapter 14. King Saul is in a military campaign and nobody could eat. Saul says, nobody's going to eat a thing until the enemy is in our hands. 
Well, Jonathan, Saul's son, did not hear this order. And there was honey, very easily accessible, for him to go and enjoy because they are zapped as in the noonday sun. They need some energy. And Jonathan goes and enjoys it. But the order given was if somebody eats before the Philistines are handed to us, they need to die. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 14, that was the order. Um, Now if you'll go to verse 43 now. 1 Samuel 14, verse 43. Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you've done. This is right after the Urim and the Thummim. The, the, the usefulness of the priest to show a yes or no, a supernatural way to get a yes or no verdict. Verse number 43, tell me what you've done. And Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the tip of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am, I will die. And Saul said, God do so to me and more also. You shall surely die, Jonathan. He's talking about his son. Verse 45, then the people said to Saul. Who's Saul? He's the king. He's the highest ranking official. Then the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die, who has worked this great salvation in Israel? Far from it. As the Lord lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people ransomed Jonathan so that he did not die. Once again, an order from a king. And the people disobeyed, revolted against it. Let's keep going. 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18. And please hang on for this because I want to make some clear conclusions on this and I want you to be confused because we're living in a strange time. 1 Kings chapter 18. You remember that Elijah is scared of his own wife, Jezebel, which is why many females are not using that name anymore for their little girl. Jezebel has a connotation with it. She's a wicked person. And Elijah is wanting to um, help her in killing all the prophets of Jehovah. But there's a fella by the name of Obadiah, who the Bible says feared the Lord greatly. And in verse number 3, Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Remember, who is the king? Ahab. What is his order? Obviously through the mouth of his wife. But what is the order? Kill all the prophets of Jehovah, of Yahweh. Kill them all. What does Obadiah do? He hides them, as many as he can find, in caves. The top official gives an order, and this man defies that order. That's civil disobedience. And God honors it. Go to Daniel chapter 3. And the reason we're taking some time to slowly walk through these is because we are living in a day and time where people are always engaged in opinion, rhetoric, preference. You need to see in the Word of God that this, on random occasions, happened. Where an order is given from governing officials and people of God go against it because they fear God more than they fear the magistrate. Daniel chapter 3. Just a quick synopsis here. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar has this golden image. He makes this golden image and he tells them to bow to this image of, of gold. 
And in defiance, there are three Hebrew uh, men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who defy this order. Remember, it is coming from King Nebuchadnezzar, the top governing official. And they say, we will not follow that. We will not do that. We cannot do that. And remember that they said, do with us what you must. And he tries to scare them by saying, I'll turn that thing up hotter. And they said, listen, hotter, I'm paraphrasing, hotter is not going to change our principles. We cannot bow. You know the rest of that account is that they threw those young men into the fiery furnace. And verse number 13 uh, says that they, they gave them two or three chances to obey this law and they would refuse it. Uh, verse number 19, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. The expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. He ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to cast them into the fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, tunics, hats, other garments, thrown into the burning fiery furnace. Verse 22, because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning fiery furnace. You notice that as they protest the orders of the king, they are also submitting joyfully to whatever consequence the king will give because they fear God and not the king. That's important. Because anytime civil, civil disobedience is called upon for the Christian, we have to be prepared as Christians to face whatever consequence that particular governing authority chooses to give. Just like they did in that text. So, and on this occasion, God preserved them. But do not think that you're always going to be a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sometimes he's pleased to glorify himself by people dying for their faith. Look at Daniel chapter 6 now. Daniel chapter 6. Another time. Now this is not King Nebuchadnezzar. This is King Darius now who's giving a decree to not pray to anyone other than the king. That was the mandate. He gave the mandate, nobody pray to anyone except, um, don't pray to any gods. Look at verse number 6, Daniel 6, verse 6. These high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed. The king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. The king signed the document and the injunction. Lots of legal language. It sounds like politics of the 21st century. A group of experts had an idea and said, King, you voice it. And by the way, the king is not free in what he voices, even if it wasn't generated in his own mind as the idea. He's still responsible. You know the rest of this story. Daniel refuses to do that. The king gives the order. He refuses that order. What happens to him? The penalty is thrown in the lion's den. And God preserves him in the lion's den. This is civil disobedience where the Christian still maintains his Christian character and violates the order that's given. Now let's go over to the New Testament. Well, the New Testament's different because this is just different. Oh, okay. Go to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. I'll tell you what is different about it. They have even more reason to rejoice because that which was promised in the prophets has now been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 4. Let's look to... Um, 
Verse number one, let's set it up this way. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and captains of the temple and Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming the resurrection from the dead, of Jesus from the dead. So you've got captains of the temple, Sadducees, who at that time are in control of the Jewish temple. Verse number five, you've got rulers, elders, scribes gathered in Israel. You've got them named there. And you've got Peter and John, and they will not hush their mouths on this Jesus. They won't keep quiet. And all they want them to do is just quiet and down. Verse number 13. And when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. They recognized they had been with Jesus. But seeing them, that's, that's a sweet text right there. It wasn't obvious they'd been to Jerusalem Seminary. What was obvious, not that they graduated from Bible college, what was obvious is that they'd been with Jesus. So, in being with Jesus, they see this man is healed, standing beside them. They have nothing to say in opposition. And then verse 16, what shall we do with these men? A notable sign has been performed, though through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. Verse 17, But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them, charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. Okay, now listen. This is coming from in that particular geographical area. It's coming from governing officials. Verse 19. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. Now go over to Acts chapter 5. And once again, let me remind you, that is governing officials giving orders that they are not going to submit to. Acts chapter 5 now. Uh, let's see, around verse, let me see here, uh, 27. Around verse 27. When they brought them, they set them before the councils. They're sitting the, the apostles before the councils. And they, the high priest questioned him, saying, what, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name. Yet here you fill Jerusalem with your teaching. You intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Verse 29, Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. Now I want to set the stage by using that text to tell you that there are times when we are commanded to obey God rather than men. Now let me be clear. I don't think any governing official has told me to stop praying to Jesus. I don't think any governing official has told me to get up, give up my Bible. I don't think any of that has happened. But we are living in a day where when you give the government an inch, they will take a mile. And even then, the Scripture doesn't tell me what's an inch and what's a mile. So we have to use discernment on things. We have to trust the Lord will give us discernment on particular things. Now, this is, not a, this is not a sermon on masks or no masks. I'm actually um, very glad that weeks before that mandate ever came out in our state, we told you we believe that personal convictions are best exercised and enforced by individuals for individuals. We believe that. And so nobody's going to look down on anybody wearing a mask. Nobody's going to look up at somebody who's not wearing a mask. When I'm in Dollar General, I've got a mask on. I forgot one the other day, had to pull my shirt up, started showing my belly, and went back out and found my mask. Last thing I want to be known as is the naval preacher. Ain't a pretty sight. Anyway, so I'm, I'm, I'm all about proprietors telling us if we need to wear masks, wear masks. That's, that's fine. Every individual can do that. But as far as I read the scriptures, 
The elders are going to be giving an account at New Hope Baptist Church for how we shepherd New Hope Baptist. I'm not going to give an account for Dollar General. I'm not going to give an account for Junction City Baptist. I'm going to give an account, and so will four other guys, for how we shepherded this flock. And I can say to you with a calm assurance that one of those areas where we feel that civil disobedience would be in order is if they told us to stop assembling. Let me tell you why. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 10 for a moment. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And let us consider verse 24 now. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, I believe and the elders of this flock believe that that is not an option, that that is not a suggestion, but that that is indeed a command. Now, there are times when personal sickness keeps you from being able to assemble. That is not the same to say that you are forsaking the assembly because you are sick. As a matter of fact, James chapter 5 gives directives as to if any of you are sick, let them call the elders to come, pray, lay hands on you, anoint with oil. That's, that means you can't be here and they're coming to you. There is a, a time when people have to excuse themselves from the assembly because of other things going on. I get that. I understand that. We're not knocking that at all. But we believe this is a command. So much so that he references people who are in the habit of not doing it. He calls them out and says some are in the habit of not assembling. Now, first of all, let me tell you that in the 21st century, we have all kinds of things right this moment that are passing for so-called assemblies. Zoom church. House church. Virtual church. Facebook church. Screen church. That's what's passing for assemblies right now. And let me be clear. Even drive through church. Let me be crystal clear on that. What we did in the backfield was still not an assembly. Were we gathering? Were we hearing God's Word? Yes. Did we celebrate the ordinances? No. Was there any exercise of church discipline? No. Was there singing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs to one another? No. Was there music played? Yes. Was there Bible read? Yes. Was there sermons preached? Yes. All those things are true, but do not cheapen the assembly by saying there's all kinds of things we can get around and do and really call it an assembly. But this begs the question, and by the way, if you wanted to have a longer discussion on that, that's fine. Um, on that one some other time. But I will say to you this, if you think that virtual church is sufficient, then every church that's assembled on virtual church and calling it just as much church should sell their facilities and give the money to the poor and never tell them to assemble again if it's the same. It's not the same, and they know it. But if the elders are responsible for the flock, and we have an outbreak, and we have an illness that runs rampant through the church, it's the elders' responsibility before God to, to, to direct the, what we should do about that. 
It's their responsibility. The weight is on their shoulders to say, look, we're quarantining y'all. Y'all getting everybody sick over here. Stay away from the middle. You, 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 that's the elder's responsibility to do that. And then listen, listen. I'm not jumping for joy that that's our responsibility. It's a weighty thing. And we don't take that lightly. But I keep coming back to this question, folks. What was the reason in this text that I just read you, what was the reason for those who got in the habit of not meeting? Do we have anything in the context to tell us why they got in that habit? I think we do. I want you to jump down in that same chapter. Verse 32. Same chapter. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while." And the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. If you were to ask me what might have been the reason for them to neglect getting together and assembling together, how did they get in that habit? I think this shines light on it they began to get a little rattled after suffering. Verse 33, they began to get a little rattled after being publicly exposed. Let me change the wording for you Kentuckians. After being publicly shamed on television, they found it rather unbecoming. They'd rather not go that route. Well, listen, 15 years ago, I'd love to have been on TV. I ain't got no desire to be on TV. But let me tell you something. We ain't forsaking the assembling. Not going to do it. We believe it's an order commanded by God to get together on the Lord's day. And if you can't, then we will pray for you because you can't. If there is an order that comes, nobody will have to text me. We have in church, I just saw on the television. No, no. Let's see. Hebrews chapter 10. I think that was written before LEX started broadcasting. But we can't do that like jerks. So let me be clear on that. If a Christian is going to resist a government that commands or compels something that is a violation of what they believe is Scripture, then they have to do so in a nonviolent way, in a way that is appropriate for Christian conduct. And if a Christian disobeys a government, and they just have to be ready to accept whatever that government's punishment is for those actions. And they have to do it joyfully. But it's also true that Christians in this day and time, in this particular country, certainly are permitted to work to install new government leaders within the laws that have been established. We would say it like this in our country. The way, to, the way to exercise um, saying what you think at this particular stage in our life is by voting.
I don't want to get on the voting rant. I want to tell you this. When we try to fulfill Titus chapter 3, we have to do it the right way, a God-honoring way, with a Christian ethic always guiding us. But when it comes to assembly, we believe that's a mandate. And right now we're able to assemble. But when we are ordered not to, we will continue to. We learned a lot from trying to make tons of concessions and trying to do what we felt was right and safe. But we won't do that again. If the elders believe it's unsafe by data we see inside our flock, if it's unsafe by an outbreak, that's going to be the elders that are making that hard call. Because we believe an assembly is called of God. Okay? Now, I realize that's the charge to the Christian to understand that. Um, uh, I can't police what you post on Facebook, but I'm not looking for a firestorm from social media. I'm talking to the flock. Um, whether you're happy about that or sad about that, if you need some more clarification, or maybe you can shed some light that we don't have, we'd love to talk with you. But you know what? At the end of the day, what matters the most is, do you know Christ Jesus? That's what matters the most. Do you know Christ, and are you telling others about Christ? Let's have a word of prayer before we dismiss. And again, if there's need for clarification, you come and see us. Father, thank you for the opportunity to gather together. And Lord, I just want to simply praise you for your gospel. Your gospel that changes lives. Your gospel of your Son, holy, in heaven, with you, coming to earth living perfectly, born of a virgin, living perfect obedience to your commands for 33 years and voluntarily taking upon himself the form of a servant and humbling himself even to death on the cross and resurrecting three days later, showing clear proof that the price had indeed been satisfied. And the, to praise you for your ascension to heaven and to praise you for your soon return. Lord, we just want to thank you for your gospel. You've opened our eyes with it. You've shown us yourself. And not only have you shown us yourself, you've given us yourself. And Lord, in the days that we see approaching, whether they get better or worse, may we be true to your word. May we be faithful. But as we are faithful, may we be Christ-like. Lord, the only way we're going to strike that balance is by your grace. May it be for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and thank you especially for enduring through all of that.